This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. I hope you're good. As always, thank you very much for tuning in. Not just today, but to all the recent episodes as well and all the feedback. It's always good to hear your thoughts on them. Uh, Always good to hear from you. If you've got some ideas for some future episodes, why not let me know? Now, as summer approaches... Some of you may have holidays in mind. Perhaps you're heading to sunnier climates, some relaxing time besides the pool or the beach. Maybe you're booked for Germany, like me. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. (laughs) I've got you covered here for all scenarios, some quality reading material and suggestions. Now, there have been a couple of new England-related books released through the good guys at Pitch Publishing, so I thought this episode will take a look at them both. There is Lions in the Wilderness, England's Decade of Decline by Clive and Joe Hetherington, and It's Coming Home, Probably, England's Football Team and One Man's Many Years of Hurt by John McNichol. And the good thing about them both is that they they almost follow on from each other. Uh, you can get them both and you'll not be reading the same thing over again. I'm sure you'll understand what I mean when I speak to them both. Now I'll let you know where you can pick them up towards the end of the episode and also where you can win copies of them. But with no further ado... Let's dive in. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the Three Lions podcast, freelance sports journalist Clive Hetherington, author of the new book, Lions in the Wilderness, England's Decade of Decline. Clive, hello there. Hi, Russell. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, very good. Good. I'm mean, keen eared listeners may may recognise your name um, as you also write for the uh, the FSA's Free Lions, the the fanzine that many of us pick up on away games. But maybe we can uh, just yeah. touch on that towards the end. Sure. the The book Lions in the Wilderness. Um, well, it focuses in on on that 1970s period, doesn't it? The decade that was kind of book ended by 1970 World Cup and, and the Euros of 1980. Mm-hmm. What sort of all went wrong in the middle, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. It's all about, uh, as you say, what was a, a desolate decade, really, uh, for England, um, being deposed as World Cup holders in Mexico uh, in 1970. And then, of course, failing to appear at another major tournament until until the Euros, as you say, in 1980. I think it was in Italy, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, I've, you know, I've been, been thinking of doing a book. I'm a first-time author. I should stress I'm I'm the co-author of this book with my son, Joe. Right. Um, who, like me, contributes to Three Lions. Um Joe is an English language graduate. He's also done a couple of film novelizations. Mm. Um, so um, it was a joint idea. I had been thinking of, of doing a book on on the 1970s, which for me um, was a sort of formative time as a, as a, as a football follower. It was when I got into football, started watching football, and, and the 1970 World Cup was my earliest memory really i still have some very vivid memories of the 1970 world cup collecting all these uh, stickers and coins yeah. and uh, all the rest of it um so um yeah i, I it's, it was a time that uh, you know for obvious reasons always always interested me in in, in football um and joe uh, was uh, was was very keen 
uh, to do the do the book with me. The idea sort of germinated uh, really during lockdown, I think, and we got to work on it um, in uh, sort of the middle of 2021. And um, yes, it's, I mean, I think it's come together pretty well, really. Yeah. I mean, was it easy or working um, with the sun or, or well, hard? <laughs> um, well, we had, we had a few uh, differences of opinion at times, shall we say. Yeah. Um, but um, no, it was it was good. Um, it was, as I say, it was, it was a new experience uh, for me doing a book. I, I you know, I had thought about doing a book for a long time. It is obviously something that you have to devote your time to. The research um, takes up obviously a considerable amount of time, and um, you know, it, uh, it it was it was an interesting process. It was, yeah. uh, was as I say, something something new. But also, you know, along the way, um, throwing up a lot of interesting little anecdotes. I've spoken to a few people, obviously. Um, Mark MacDonald has done the foreword for the book. Uh, I've known Malcolm for uh, many years. Um, he very kindly uh, did the foreword and also effectively supplied a, a chapter for the book, really, talking about his five goals for England in 1975 against Cyprus in the European Championship qualifier at Wembley. Um, some interesting uh, stories about uh, Don Revy, who uh, was seemingly reluctant to call Malcolm up in the first place yeah, um, and didn't make him feel particularly welcome. But uh, Malcolm uh, obviously uh, answered him with... Uh, <laughs> With with that nap hand of goals, um, so um, yeah. Uh, as I say, um, you know, I've I've, I've had uh, some help from from people in football who you know were, were happy to speak to me and uh, give me that time. Malcolm was was one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Also spoke to uh, Brian Pop Robson. Oh yes, uh, who um, <clears throat> played like Malcolm played for. For Newcastle, uh, left Newcastle before Malcolm came, of course. But uh, spoke to to Pop, um, who didn't play for England, unfortunately. Should have done, and uh, I think, in the opinion of most people, Jimmy Greaves said that uh, he was uh, the best striker never to play for England. Right. Pop um, spoke to Pop for his insight on Ron Greenwood, because uh, obviously Pop uh, played under him at West Ham, um, and um, also spoke to. Um, uh, David Mills, um, who uh, played for Middlesbrough and uh, West Brom and Newcastle, among others. Uh, David, of course, was the first half million pound signed by a, a British club when he uh, moved uh, to West Brom from Middlesbrough in 1979. And I spoke to David about Harold Shepherdson, who was um, Sir Alf Ramsey's right-hand man in 1966 uh, when we won the World Cup, obviously, and Stayed with England, uh, um, well, I think he worked with England for about 17 years. Yeah, he was uh, certainly in there. Part of the backroom staff and stayed right through until 1974. Yeah, um, quite a while. When Joe Mercer stepped down as uh, as caretaker before Revy came in. Yeah, that's plenty crammed in within the pages here. What, re what do you think went wrong in the 1970s for England? Is there one main thing or is it a... That's combination of a lot of things. I think it's very yeah. I, I know so to squeeze it all in in a short conversation. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think it's very difficult, very difficult um, to, to, to pinpoint. It, it's a bit of a mystery, I think. Uh, you know, I think um, you know, you 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 would have imagined that that, that Don Revy would have would have been the ideal uh, long term replacement, uh, given his his track record at Leeds. Yeah, uh, for, uh, for for Ramsey. Um, but obviously it didn't work out that way. And he, uh, left under a cloud, went to the UAE. Um, yeah, it's difficult to think. We've done a chapter actually, um, called Famine and the Feast, which contrasts the struggles of the England team in the 1970s, um, with the successes of, uh, English clubs in Europe. It's a, it's a bit of a curiosity that it was a, it was a great time for, for English clubs in Europe, yeah, um, but not not for the national side. I mean, obviously Liverpool won back-to-back -back European Cups in nineteen 
77 and 78, then Forrest in 79, as well, of course, in, in, in 80, uh, won the European Cup as well. But um, it, it's, uh, it's a strange one. Um, I think um, in, in some ways, and it's something we, that, we, that Joe and I touched on, I think, is it, I think um, England in many ways had um, an embarrassment of, of riches. We, you know, there were a huge right. number of talented players around. And I think at times, um, s- certainly with Revy and uh, even even with Ramsey to some extent, I, I think I think it was difficult for them to know which way to turn. And you know, Ramsey began to chop and change. Obviously, you know, the team uh, that, that won the World Cup and uh, lost in 1970 gradually. The players re- retired um, and were replaced, but he didn't seem to be able to settle. On, on, on a regular lineup, and certainly Revy really threw England caps around like confetti. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, it, as I say, in answer to the question, I think it's 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 difficult to pinpoint what went wrong. I think um, possibly, you know, it partly was because neither Ramsey uh, nor Revy uh, seemed to be able to to hit on a settled side. Which obviously Ramsey had had um, in the in the sixties and, uh, and 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 early seventies. Yeah, I'm wondering, just off the top of my head, actually thinking about it, is maybe a a, a comparison, maybe to, to Alex Ferguson at Manchester United, winning so many trophies, then obviously stood mm. down, um, and then the, the the following managers have just had these so much pressure on them that they couldn't emulate yeah. um what he done and likewise Alf Ramsey obviously won the World Cup the, the pinnacle yes. for England and then sort of the the people to come following him just just couldn't maybe live up to that just within themselves and also the media pressure or, the, or just the, the general well, yeah. pressure for the time I don't know yeah I, I certainly think the media pressure became I mean as somebody who's worked in newspapers for, for over 40 years I I, I know that I mean, the, the 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 media pressure certainly um, intensified. I think in the nineteen seventies, the scrutiny uh, was was greater. Right. Um, so I think I think you're right there, and and, and obviously, as you say, Sir Alex Ferguson set the bar very high at Manchester United, and Sir Arthur Ramsey set the bar very high. Yeah, and he couldn't have set it higher. No, um, with England, obviously. So again, yes, I think I think you're right. I think. Um, you know, in many ways, uh, Ramsey was a very hard, if not impossible, act to follow, and I think uh, that's, that's proved to be the case at Manchester United. Certainly, I think uh, Sir Alex. Um, <clears throat> I still think that perhaps they uh, should have given David Moyes a bit longer, personally. But um, yeah, I, I think um, a, a, a standard was was set under Ramsey. Um, which was uh, which was obviously very difficult to match. Mm. So, um, yeah, and 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 Revy. Well, it's the curious thing again about Revy. I mean, Revy named virtually the same team every week at Leeds, and yet when he took over as England manager, he made uh, you know numerous numerous changes. Um, I think there was a new cap every game on on average. I think it was it twenty twenty nine. Um, Twenty nine um, caps, uh, twenty nine new caps, was it? Really? Um, yeah. Oh wow! I, I didn't didn't know that. It was mm. just slightly before my time, Don Revy. But yeah, it's yeah. Um, interesting to hear that. I mean, whilst it was a a bleak time on the pitch for England, obviously not qualifying for for the Euros, the World Cups um, at the time, there were some positives, though, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we've we've done a chapter actually in the book, which which you know took as, as I've already said, we've we've done a chapter called Famine the Feast, which talks about you know the successes of English clubs in in in, in Europe. We, we, we've also we've also done a chapter, um, which which is uh, titled uh, Hit Men and and uh, Mavericks, which um, is about the, um, the the great strikers. And flair players and characters who played for England in in the nineteen seventies. There were there were a lot of entertainers. Yeah. Um, and England, uh, you know, at times were very good to watch. At times they weren't very good to watch. Obviously, 
But, you know, I mean, one one game that still sticks in my mind, obviously, is, 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 is the game against Poland in 73. How they didn't win that match, nobody will, will ever no. know if, if anybody's ever sat and watched that game. Uh, I mean, I remember watching it as a as, as a child. Um, the, the the chances they had uh, that night, uh, the football they played that, and they played some great football that night. Um, the, the chances they had um, were were in an absolute abundance, um, and how they didn't win the game, um, and obviously they ended up failing to qualify for the for the seventy four World Cup. How they didn't uh, win the game is is again a, another one of football's great mysteries. It was, <laughs> Yeah. A night that, of uh, agony, really. <laughs> that was the the game. Didn't Brian Clough call the goalkeeper a clown? Was that that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah Thomas Shevsky. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, I mean, he he was he was uh, unconventional, uh, uh, certainly. And uh, but he did he did actually at the same time. He although he, although he made some very unorthodox saves, he also made a few brilliant saves as well. Right. To, to be fair to him, <laughs> <laughs> just just doing his job. Just doing his job. He said yeah. his job. Yeah, yeah. Now, one one player of the time was Viv Anderson. Broke down. Yeah, broke down some barriers, didn't he? Yeah, I was going to come to that. Yeah, uh, we've uh, done a chapter on the emergence of, of, of black players, and uh, obviously Viv, uh, who I had some dealings with when he was up here at, at Middlesbrough uh, with um, Brian Robson, the other Brian Robson. Um, yeah, Viv obviously became the first black player uh, to win a senior England cap. It was a real trailblazer. Um, and um, Laurie Cunningham uh, gets a mention as well, the late Laurie Cunningham, um, who David Mills uh, played with briefly at, uh, at West Brom. So, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, a, a decade of, of, uh, of, of, of change and obviously change for the positive with yes. so many good young black players emerging. Yeah. Something now that sort of almost bizarre to look back on that how mm. how that was then and to what we know now. Um but yeah, um Viv Anderson coming in was was great for the uh, for the English game. Mm. I should also mention actually um I'm talking about people I've, I've spoken to I spoke to um Terry McDermott oh, yeah. um and, and also uh, the late Gordon McQueen um, spoke to Terry to uh, talk about uh, Ron Greenwood's time. And um, I spoke to Gordon, uh, who sadly died uh, recently, um, about um, the Great England-Scotland games, which were a huge feature of the 1970s, obviously, um, the home international championships. Um, just to get a, a Scottish perspective on those games, Gordon famously scored for Scotland uh, Wembley in 1977 when they won two one, and the Tartan Army uh, celebrated by pulling down the crossbars and yeah. uh, digging up the the turf. It was uh, some ways a, a repeat of what had happened before in the in, in the 1960s. Um, so I also, as I say, I should I should mention. Um, uh, Terry and as, as I say, Gordon, uh, who also um, uh, kindly spoke to me. Yeah. Well, lots crammed within the uh, the book Lions in the Wilderness. Um, I say a, a decade where where England didn't didn't really do particularly well. Obviously, times now are are very much different, and we're we're qualifying for tournaments on a regular yeah. basis. What are your thoughts ahead of the the upcoming European Championships? I, I thought you might ask me that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, well, I would like to say uh, it's uh, coming home, but um, if my uh, head is going to rule my heart, um, I can see them uh, getting to the quarters uh, or the semis. But I just, it's probably down to bitter past experience hmm. but i just think we will fall short again uh sadly uh i hope i'm wrong obviously yeah. but i just think that um <clears throat> you know the, the the quarters or the semis is probably where we'll be bowing out again um i mean i think we could we could face italy in the quarters now we have beaten italy a couple of times lately yeah. um yeah. 
So, and then I think there's also a possibility of us facing France after that, isn't there? I, think. Mm, I believe so. Like, if, yeah. if it goes to plan in the mm. semi, is it semi final? Yeah, in the semis, yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I mean, it's an exciting young team, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, it would be great to see them go all the way. Um, but uh, uh, if, if you want my honest opinion, I just think that we'll fall short again, I'm afraid. Fair enough. Tell us a little bit about um, Free Lions and, and how you came to be involved in that. Because cause I'll yeah. always pick it up when um, when I'm away from home. Uh, what's the last? Um, would have been the last one was North Macedonia, I think. Um, where I yes. where I read you there. Um, do you do you yeah. go to the games yourself as well? I I I I don't I don't know. Um, I've been working for uh, the FSA for, for free for Free Lions for eleven. I've been doing it for eleven years now. Right. Um, I took over from a former colleague of mine who worked for the Sunday Mirror, Brian McNally, who had done it um, for many years. I was uh, approached by Kevin Miles, yes, uh, the, the uh, chief executive of the uh, Football Sports Association, to do it. Uh, I've known Kevin a long time. Um, big Newcastle fan, obviously, Kevin. So I started uh, working for them in 2013, and then I brought Joe in to do a bit as well. Um, he's done the odd, odd feature, a few features, and... Also uh, writes the uh, the key three on the opposition. We've sort of kept it in the family there, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been doing it for for eleven years. But I I don't go. No, I, I basically cover cover the games off off TV. <laughs> right. Yep. So um, yes, I've been, I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed doing that. Um, as I say, for 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 over a decade, and I'll be doing it again uh, this summer. Of course. Yeah. I've been watching from afar. Um, yeah. Will, will you be out there? Yes, I'll be. I'll yes. be going. There. I thought you might yes. be. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's always a good read. I, I can, uh, I can give you that. I do enjoy reading oh, the that. free lines. Um, and as yeah. as is the as is the book, Lions in the Wilderness. John, just yeah. let us know where we can pick up a copy of that. Yeah, well, as as they say, uh, for more good booksellers, um, yeah. it's obviously uh, it's uh, on on Amazon. The ebook is already on on Kindle edition. I must uh, just say a quick thanks to uh, Paul Camillan and the team at uh, Pitch as well for uh, commissioning the book. Yeah, it's as I say, it's it's uh, it's available at all, all all good booksellers. Great stuff. Well, I, w- I wish you all the very best of it. Um, perhaps thanks so very much uh, indeed, Russell. Yeah, perhaps our, our younger listeners who who weren't around at the time, but well, myself included, um, plenty to plenty to learn from it. I hope you enjoy it, yeah. Great stuff. Um, Clive, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Russell. All the best. Wonderful to speak with Clive there all about his book, Lions in the Wilderness. Now we're going to move on. Skip a decade. The 80s. Pretend it never happened uh, and rejoin our England journey at the beginning of the 90s and make our way to the present day. As I'm pleased to be joined by John McNichol, author of An Ode to 442 and An Ode to the Chosen Few. Now, his latest publication is It's Coming Home, probably the England football team and one man's many years of hurt. Something I think many of us can relate to. John, hello there. How are we? You all right? I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, good. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. No, you're more than welcome. It's coming home, hopefully, or probably. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I mean, look, it's the hope that kills you, so they say. Oh, doesn't it just? Yeah, we've... How many times have we been there? Yeah, and we get to we get to we get to do it all again in another couple of weeks. Yes, yes, you're right. I mean, it's it's the build up is always. I, I love the build up to a tournament, um, and obviously, I love the tournament. Um, but I don't know if there's like a a difference between that that feeling of build up, like it's, it's almost like getting to Christmas, isn't it? As yeah, like, it's a 
yeah, it is, it is, it's, it's, it's a fantastic sort of the, the lead up, the first, the couple of weeks up until the, just the first, get the first match, the opening day, and then, and then you're in it, and That's then right. you're just tuned by it until, until the sort of final whistle in the final, regardless of England's progress. I always tend to think that, uh, you know, sometimes if uh, if we don't go as far as what we we would intend to, I still find that I'll, I'm watching, ev- kicking every ball. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We're all, always yeah. You can't can't tear yourself away from it once the the final comes round, and even if we're not in it, you, you always kind of look at it and go, oh, we we could have got to the final via that team, or we could have beaten them in this final. It's it's always the way like that. You think, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Well, like I say, it's the it's the hope that kills you, and and we wouldn't have it any other way as England fans. I don't think. No, I think you're right. So the book, it's coming home probably. England, England football team, and one man's many years of hurt. How did this all come about? Um, well, I sort of I first first book I wrote about was was about teams. Second one was about players, and I sort of didn't really know where to go from there. So. Um, sort of thumbed around with a few ideas and then uh and then just sort of just st- I started writing an article uh for a website um mm. and it was just about getting into football like what how did you get into football um and that year 1990 I was I was 10 years old and it was it was really when my love for football sort of started um and that was obviously helped with the whole sort of Italia 90 um because um sort of everyone you know, I just remember everyone at the time because football wasn't on the telly as much as what it is now. No. So seeing England on the TV going through the tournament, like everyone sort of got swept up in it. Um, and it obviously it helped get into the semi final and, and sort of in some ways the 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 eventuality of the penalty shootout defeat sort of brought everyone sort of back together because people were sort of falling out of love with the national team. And so it sort of give it a little bit of a kickstart going into sort of like the next decade, so to speak. Yeah, I think you're right. And as I think we're we're quite similar in our in our age here. Yeah, 1990 was that sort of first World Cup that I really remember. Um, I think we kind of look at it through rose tinted glasses, don't we? Because whilst obviously we got to the semi final. It wasn't the best of tournaments, really, was it? No, with regards it, to goals and that, was it? I think it's it hasn't it been voted. I, I think that and South Africa twenty ten have been voted like the two worst World Cups, sort of in modern sort of history. Um, and it, it also culminated in the the, the abolition of um, the back pass rule, um, right? Yeah, because people in in ninety were just so sick of the. Of the of the continuous time wasting and you know just re- teams going one nil up and then just playing it round the back and chipping it back to the goalkeeper. So I think Italia ninety, correct me if I'm wrong, might have been the uh, might have been the end of the back pass rule for uh, international tournaments. But yeah, it, it was very down. It was a very low scoring World Cup as well, if I remember. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, across the board. So um, yeah, I mean. Uh, obviously, we saw we've seen a lot better quality over the years, but I don't know. Yeah, like I say, it just at that time, I think get into that semi final and sort of a, a sort of we had well, they weren't really fancied at the start of the tournament, and and obviously getting that far sort of brought everyone together and sort of Bobby Robson's uh, swan song as well, um, which probably helped. What's your research um, into it? I mean, did you have to sort of be trawling back through YouTube and? various sort of news art websites news articles yeah so so basically i wrote a, a list of every every two years from italia 90 up to qatar 2022 so mm. obviously you know what so it just alternates world cup european championships every two years and then and then just literally started going through like the qualification process so yeah youtube i mean luckily enough um, you can just about get enough quality back at 1990 on YouTube, sort of anything before then, and it starts getting a little bit, um, it's a sketchy, bit isn't it? yeah, it's a little bit harder to find. And same as, um, like sort of newspaper articles and things, because obviously the internet weren't around and sort of much before sort of the late 90s. So anything sort of pre 2000s newspaper article wise is quite, quite tough. I joined, um, 
the British newspaper, like a like a archive. Oh, yeah. um, so paid a monthly subscription and then just sort of trawled through, uh, trying to find articles for sort of like the dates after games to see what the papers would have said and things like that. So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot tougher. The first sort of few chapters were definitely a lot tougher than the last few. That was that's a dead cert. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't, don't realise now, or maybe the, the kids nowadays don't realise how easy that they've got it with all all like sort of information to hand. Sort of back in my day, it's like go find an encyclopedia or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's um, it, it it's incredible how how uh, how easy it is, and you can get yourself into a bit of a wormhole because you will be looking for sort of. David Platt's volley against Belgium in 1990, and before you know it, you're you're wa- you're watching David Platt's top 30 goals at <laughs> Sampdoria or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And it, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, so it, it it does sort of lead on to, but you do find some real gems that are sort of off the beaten track as well. So it does has does has its advantages, but yeah, that, that that's the the writing of the book itself is is relatively the easy part. It's mm. the it's the like I say the research, the trawling through the the archives and the articles and the videos to try and find out right you know is this is this worth putting in to people people because you know you you're generally writing something that people know like you say you know the outcome of the story so yes. you know um, so you've got to try and make it a little bit more exciting and try and like I say lead people off the beaten track of what they know already. Yeah, go on what. I don't don't want to give too much away from the book because obviously I want people to go and go and um, buy it and read it themselves. But go on, give us one of those gems that you sort of uncovered in doing your research. Well, uh, I was lucky enough to interview Darren Anderton. Oh yeah, and and I thought that was fantastic because you know uh, he took time out of his busy schedule because he lives in America now. So um, and he was very sort of open about uh, his sort of England time. Uh, and obviously there's the interviews in the book so uh people can get to to sort of read that but it's just you know it's just finding like your 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 articles from sort of foreign players as well like opposition players some of the stuff that I didn't obviously know um at the time so you, you know you're talking about um like Rude Hullet for example coming out when we played uh, Holland in Italia 90, who were the European champions at the time, mm. and we dropped nil-nil, and they had, you know, Hullet, Van Basten. Um, but he came out in the, after the game and sort of said along the lines of, you know, we were lucky, we were lucky England couldn't, you know, finish their, finish their chances today. And, and just it's just sort of little clips like that, that you sort of, you wouldn't, unless you look for it, you wouldn't know, you know? Yeah. I mean, of course, Holland were the, uh, the team that two years prior to that had, beat us out of sight in the Euros, hadn't they? Um, on yeah, their way to going to win it. Yeah. So so to be given that sort of credit from the likes of Hullet and and that is just shows sort of how far England had come on in those sort of two years. Um Yeah, but- I mean, um yeah, it was a it was a real it was a real transformation, but obviously we sort of we spiked and then and then sort of went a bit flat again and sort of stumbled through the Graham Taylor era and 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 then obviously sort of you know, we we kick started again when we went into Euro '96 um, on home soil, which again was a was another fantastic sort of childhood memory, which was which is a lot of in the book is a lot of memories, you know, and emotions and things from sort of you know, like I say, from being ten years old in Italia '90 to you know becoming a, a fully grown person, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, and and one player like I say, you've already spoken to Darren Anderson. He he could have really made a name for himself in that game against Germany, couldn't he? It was it was him and Gazza. If Gazza's studs had been, I don't know, half an inch longer, or or Darren Anderson hadn't hit the post in that that game against Germany, we could have made it through to the final, couldn't we? Yeah, I mean, like it's the, it, the the book is littered with just so many like nearly moments, you know. Um, and I always I always felt that we always seemed to get the Sort of the rough end of the uh, refereeing decisions and the and the you know the the, the ghost goal against Germany in uh, twenty ten and yes you know, all, all that sort of thing. I think we we seem to get more than sort of our average share than what everyone else does uh, when it comes to tournament football. 
But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, like I say, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, more lows, obviously. Um, but uh, but yeah, doing the research and going back through and sort of revisiting all this again, watching the watching the games on YouTube and and reading the reports, it it, it brought a lot of it flooding back. Um, you know, like say some some good, some some not so good, but um, you know, some some of them decisions still hurt. Yeah, I'm just thinking as well. One decision that um, sort of really went against us, and or ultimately we didn't go to the tournament because of it, was the the '94 World Cup, where uh, I think it was David Platt that was hauled down by. Was that? Uh, it was. Um, yeah, it was David Platt played through by Cooman. Sin- yeah, was it Cooman who pulled him down? Yeah, it was Ronald Cooman. Yeah, he yeah. obviously pulled him down. Referees give him a yellow card, and then. Ten minutes later, he's bent a free kick into the top corner. Yeah, um, VAR would have had a field day with that, wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, you know, if VAR, it would have wiped out three quarters of the content of my book, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, because like I say, there were so many, so many decisions that you, you would have, it would have gone the other way, or well, you, you would have thought so. Who knows in VAR? Yeah, but um, but no, uh, yeah. So I mean, th- they. They did us at Wembley as well because um, Gascoigne got elbowed. We were two 0 up in the home game, and Gascoigne got elbowed in the face, broke his cheekbone, had to go off at half time, and he was absolutely running the show. Right, uh, and it was a sort of off the ball moment that sort of didn't get picked up. Um, and then obviously we ended up drawing two all, and then sort of like I say, we we went over there needing to needing to not lose, and then um, yeah, Ronald Koeman uh, did us dirty. Did. Yes, yeah, I remember that. I remember that as a kid. Um, I mean, there, there's loads of or various chapters in the book that obviously look at each of the the tournaments and and just let's say this this one on Darren Anderson. There's also one on on Sven. Um, how, how did you how do you remember Sven being as England manager? Well, the reason I gave Sven his own chapter, I, I really enjoyed his sort of period of of being England manager. Yeah. It, it obviously, like like all managers at, at all levels, when it gets towards the end, it starts get, becoming a little bit uh, a bit stale and a bit, you know, it, it just doesn't, it's not as fun as what it was. But, you know, I mean, that, that night in Germany when we when we won 5-1 um, is, is one, of the, one of my best times being an England fan. I thought, yeah. you know, absolutely unbelievable. Um, and probably... Arguably our best away performance in history. Um, I think you'd be hard pushed to find a different one. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, and obviously, you know, he was first foreign manager to to come over and and, and take the reins. Um, and he was, he, I just, he was very likable. And I think he, you know, in the uh, in the tournaments, I, I just believe that he he was, he you know, he, he had his own sort of bad luck, you know. One kick, one way, you know, penalty shootouts twice. Um, could have taken that team a bit further, really. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, at, at the moment, he's he's getting a lot of love, and, and rightly so. Um, but it's just just unfortunate that um, well, it's just sad, isn't it? The his his current situation, but he's he's getting a lot of love throughout the the football world. I've seen. Yeah, and he deserves it. You know, he's had, he's had a cracking. He had a cracking career, um, obviously in Italy, and and then obviously uh, he, he he did a, I, I, in my opinion, I think he did a, a he did a decent job with England. I mean, I suppose you're always going to be looked at on what what trophies or whatever you're going to win, but obviously only Alf Ramsey, only Sir Alf has ever managed to do that. So, um, but I just think, yeah, it, it was a good time. It was a good time uh, under Sven, um, and I thought he was a decent manager. Yeah. Um, Probably could have done a bit better with the squad at his disposal. Um, in the mod, if he'd have had the squad now, um, uh, with the way football's played, with you know, predominantly not playing four four two, like he did, um, I think you'd have seen a completely different side. But we were where we were, and that's 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 where we ended up. That's right. It was of its time, and sort of, it was then followed by another low period in. England's history, a, a, a certain Mr. McLaren. Um, what, what's your take on Steve McLaren? Um, 
I mean, <laughs> uh, good coach, probably not a very good manager. Yeah. Um, he's had a mixed success in his sort of managerial career over the years, but that that England team, two thousand and eight, when we didn't qualify for the Euros, um, was it was absolute disgraceful that he never that he never that he never got us there. Um, it was just and, stacked of quality, wasn't it? And the whole, you know, he axed David Beckham in his first in his first as soon as he got appointed, he took Beckham out. Said you know, and then and then at the end of the at the end of qualification, he was bringing him back in, so he sort of undermined himself straight away. But yeah, it was um, it 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 was even though it was sort of towards the end of what they were called the golden generation, there was still more than enough to to beat Croatia to qualify and out that group. It was sacrilege that they didn't get there. We go through from there, Fabio Capello uh, as Roy Hodgson. Uh, Sam Allardyce as well. Um, he's he's got a tiny little little piece, Sam, in the uh, in the book, and then we sort of get to get to the current crop and and Gareth Southgate. Do you think that's? I mean, it's clearly where it's sort of all all turned now. It's it's just a totally different England side when you look back through the through the years that you've written about. What's your take on Gareth? Um, he's not for me. No. Okay. Um, no, he's not for me. I think, I think he's too cautious. Mm. Uh, I think both times when we led against against um, uh, Croatia in the semi final of the World Cup, when we went one nil up, um, and we sat back, and then when they equalised and we went to extra time, and he just never looked like we had a plan B that was going to get us back in in front. And it was yeah. exactly the same I found against Italy in the. Euro 2020 final. Um, we went one and up in the second minute. Great. And then just all of a sudden, we were just penned back for 85 minutes on our 18 yard box. And you're thinking, we've got all these good players. Um, but no, it's like, I, I, in my opinion, I think we've probably got one of the best England sides in my lifetime, but probably yep. one of the worst England managers. I think if we'd have, if we'd have had someone else, Sven. Fabio, with the way, like you say, with the way modern football is now, with the you know the free in midfield and free up front and and all that, I think it, it would have been been such a different uh, a different side. But again, um, you know, he's 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 obviously he's got results and he's got to he's got to the to the killer parts in tournaments and then just not quite being able to to still get us there. You know, um, same as France, Harry Kane scores that. Scores that penalty, goes to extra time, and then you know it's probably a lottery of a penalty shootout again. But he just, for me, just lacks that conviction of of just the killer instinct. Um, I'm hoping he proves me wrong in a couple of weeks. Well, yeah, I mean, you're not alone in in what you say. Many people do say that about Gareth. But I mean, I, I said to to Clive Hetherington um, earlier on in the podcast about where he he thinks we'll end up in the in the in the Euros in the summer, he was like maybe quarters, maybe semis. What's what's your take on on the tournament for the summer? How do you think we'll do? I think um, I, th- I think yeah, I, I think the, the the Euros is a lot tougher than the World Cup. Yeah, because I think the European teams on a whole are a lot stronger than at the World Cup. You'll have a couple of South American teams and a couple of African teams and. You know, a sort of one, you know, like a Japanese team or Korea, etc. So I always think the European sides, as on the whole, are obviously stronger, um, but they can't all qualify for the World Cup because they only have so many spaces. So um, yeah, so I think it's it's tough. I mean, France, uh, France, uh, uh, they're just such a good side. They've just, and you never know what you're going to get with Spain, Germany on home soil. You've got to be looking at them to get to sort of last four. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be tough, and and I haven't really done my research on, you know, if we finish first, who do we get in the next round? So um, I've been a bit lazy in that respect because I'm trying to just w- wind down the foot the, the regular football season. So yeah, um, but I mean, a stab in the dark, you'd say you've got to, you've got to be getting quarterfinals because that's just qualification, um, and 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 one more game. So, but um, but with the team we've got. 
you, you, you've got to be realistic and saying we should be, we should be there or thereabouts, really. Um, I think if, if we only get to the quarters, I think it would be a bit of a disaster. We've got arguably the best striker in the world, number nine in the world at the moment, in Harry Kane. We've got Jude Bellingham, who's absolutely doing the business at yeah. Real Madrid. My only concern at the moment is we don't seem to have central defenders because John Stones and Aaron Maguire both can't stay fit. Yes, yeah, I think that is that's my main point of concern is is the uh, is the defence and the back line. Uh, I've got got every faith in everywhere else on the pitch, but it's just if there's a player that's injured in that back line, then whoever comes in to replace it just sort of messes up that cohesion of of that sort of back lineup that's been together for quite some time, really. So, yeah, that that's my um, that's my concern as well. Going back to the to the book, what what was your favourite part to to research? What what brought back the most memories? Um, well, Italia ninety, obviously, as I say, that was my that was my sort of the the start, and I really liked that one. But I I also enjoyed obviously Euro ninety six because it, it you know it was close to home. Um, but two thousand and two was a was a good one as well. I like I like the um. I like the World Cup that was in Japan and Korea. Yeah. Um when we lost in the quarter final to Brazil. Um like I say it's it, it's it's emotion from sort of the time. Um yeah, I remember remember sitting in the pub crying when uh when Ronaldinho whipped one over Siemens head from forty yards, um, you know, at ten o'clock in the morning because yeah. that's when things were played at the time. Um but yeah, so sort of so because there's you know I, I don't know if you're like me but one of the tournaments i absolutely despised i just i didn't like anything about it from the from the first minute to the was the world cup in 2010 in south africa right um i just thought it was a horrendous tournament um just it couldn't get into it and england obviously didn't play that well so didn't really and then sort of a couple of tournaments after that when hodgson took over so sort of 2012, 2014, just it was just sort of one bit disastrous after another. Sort of had sort of four to six years of 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 the team becoming old, and then a lot of youngsters coming in that were were inexperienced. So um, yeah, so that so them sort of tournaments were sort of you you watch the videos back and you sort of erased them from the memory banks. Because, <laughs> Yeah. Because they just weren't that memorable and they weren't anything to get excited about. You know, we went out with a whimper and penalties in 2012 against Italy and 2014, we didn't even get out of group. And then 2016, you know, we're losing to Iceland. And so that's so that sort of three tournaments where it was just, yeah, was, like I say, there was just nothing to really get excited about. Um, and, and, and until, so I suppose, 2018 when... Um, we sort of marched to another semi final, but um, but yeah, so it sort of the older ones um, were were more fun to research because I've, I've, I felt they were good teams that you could connect to, you know, like Shearers and sort of 96, 98, they were good sides. So things like that, really, sort of older, and then and then there's a little gap, and then you fill the gap again with another team you relate to. Um, and then there's another gap. So it, it, that's how I found my support in England. No, I, th- I think it's something that that many of us as England fans can relate to. And and the book, well, it will bring it all home to us. Um, and it was it will hopefully come home um, for us. Just yes. just tell us where we can where we can get the book from. So it's available on Amazon, uh, WH Smiths, Waterstones. So yeah, all available direct from Pitch Publishing. And uh, am I right in saying you're you're on on social media with it, aren't you? Yeah, I'm on X. Yeah, so my handle is uh, at the Wishy Man eighty, and the book handle is uh, at It's Coming Home BK. So you can find it on there, and obviously the links are, are there if people want to click on it. Lovely, John. I wish you all the very best with the book, and yeah, let's let's hope that it does come home. Uh, absolutely absolutely cheers Russell thanks for having me
Thank you so much to John there and also to Clive before him. So just to recap, Clive and Joe Hetherington together wrote Lions in the Wilderness, England's Decade of Decline. And John McNichol there, who wrote It's Coming Home, Probably. Both of these are available at your regular bookshops, online at the likes of Amazon and Waterstones, of course, and direct through Pitch Publishing, who I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, for connecting me together with these two good chaps. I said at the very beginning of this episode, you can win a copy of each of these books. Both have kindly donated a copy to Block 109's monthly draw as a prize. Every month, the 109 supporters group have a draw where you can win a cash prize and also some extra goodies. It costs £5 a month to be part of. All the proceeds go towards charitable causes where England are playing. To date, they have raised and donated over £6,000, which is superb. Uh, It's not just money either. Uh, In the past, they've donated books, sporting equipment to schools, defibrillators to various places too. They are so important, defibrillators. Uh, So if you are on Twitter, seek them out at EnglandBlock109 or there is the website block 109 .co.uk. There, it will give you a little more of an insight. I wish you all the best of luck. A couple of great books. They could be yours. And as the saying goes, you've got to be in it to win it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget, you can follow the show on social media. Just search Three Lions Podcast. Give it a like or a follow. And then there is the Kofi account should you want to help with the the ongoing hosting costs for the podcast, ko-fi.com forward slash three lions podcast, ko-fi.com forward slash three lions podcast. Thank you so much if you've done that already. You know it, the Euros, they're getting ever closer. Don't forget, we've got those warm-up games against Bosnia and Iceland to come. I'll be doing a preview for that very soon. I hope you can join me for it. So until then, take care of yourselves. Cheers. <laughs>